Okay, so hello everyone, Professor Gert, thank you so much for accepting our humble invitation. Uh, so we are uh, a group of people, PhD students, master students, and we have like some professors who are interested in working on ontological security and agonism to some extent. So we were excited to like ask you to have you with us to discuss your book, The Philosophy of War and Exile, which I find uh, find it so much related to ontological security. And among the group, I have my supervisor, Professor Betul Chilik, with whom I'm working on uh, papers on ontological security. And I think like our paper also related to philosophy of war and exile. So uh, I think like in some, this book, your book, although you haven't used the word or the term of ontological security, is highly related to this concept. So thank you so much again for accepting our invitation. And let me introduce you to the audience briefly. Uh, professor Nolan Gertz is an assistant professor of applied philosophy at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And he is also the coordinator of uh, the Center for Ethics and Technology in the same university. So far, he has three books, The Philosophy of War and Exile, 2014, which is the book we are discussing now, Nihilism and, Techno and Technology, 2018, and Nihilism from MIT, uh, 2019. He is interested in political philosophy, existential phenomenology, and also like he interacts both of them and he focuses focuses on uh, responsibility and nihilism. These two concepts, I think they, they are related to ontological security and agonism. So uh, Professor Gerd, thank you again and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you everyone uh, uh, for coming. Thank you Samir for uh, inviting me and uh, uh, I don't remember now. How long am I supposed to talk again? Can you remind me? Or will you just stop me at some point? <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, like take your time. I think it is almost an informal meeting. So there is no boundary for uh, the, the presentation. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still recovering from giving a, a four hour lecture on Rousseau and Hegel the other day. So I, I will do my best, but... Uh, This is, uh, as Samir said, uh, my first book. Uh, this uh, is actually my first time giving a presentation on the book. Um, it's uh, uh, not on a topic, I guess, that's gotten as much excitement as my books on nihilism and technology. Um, but I do think of the three books as, as on similar topics, even though the word nihilism doesn't appear as much. Um, so just to give you some background, um, so this is the uh, table of contents. Uh, this was based on my, uh, my PhD, uh, which was a uh, criticism of just war theory. Um, I expanded it uh, into this book. So basically the, the two chapters that start the book are from the PhD and the rest is new. Uh, my, my PhD supervisor told me, uh, just get the PhD done, then then you write your book. So that's what uh, that's what I did. And uh, if if there's other PhDs here, uh, I don't know if that's the advice you you get, but that's the advice I give my own PhDs. Uh, so this was the article that actually um, uh, motivated me to to write this project in the first place. Um, so luckily, I, I had a roommate at the time who uh, subscribed to The New Yorker. And I, I read this article, and this is where I got the, uh, the idea that basically what was being written about here uh, is, is uh, not only psychologically or psychiatrically meaningful, but also philosophical. Um, I actually contacted Dan Baum while I was writing the book. Uh, and he uh, had the idea of us writing a book together, but he wanted it to be uh, more of like an airport uh, book. So uh, go around interviewing soldiers. Um, I didn't really want to do that kind of book. So I wrote a book instead that nobody read. Maybe maybe he was right. Well, we'll see. Um, 
So uh, this was the kind of statistics uh, that motivated the book. Statistics which uh, you did not see on the news uh, in the United States. Um, and again, it was interesting to me when I started researching uh, the book, people uh, took for granted that I must be a veteran myself because they, they basically said, well, why would you care, right? Uh, so that itself is sort of the, what the book is about, right? This idea that this is a military issue um, and that if you care, that you must be part of the military yourself. Uh, and for those wondering, I'm, I'm not a veteran in case, uh, in case that comes up. Although I have had veterans uh, contact me since, uh, but that's something we could talk about later maybe. Um, so first of all, what actually is PTSD? Here is the uh, most recent uh, diagnostic statistical manual definition. Uh, you'll see that there are uh, numerous criteria. Uh, the, uh, the history of PTSD uh, is itself uh, contested um, and it's, it's sort of fascinating how it uh, evolved during the Vietnam War. Uh, so the concept itself has existed for a long time uh, in various forms, uh, most notably as, as shell shock, uh, but at various times it's had various definitions and it's most recently become psych psychiatrically uh, diagnosed uh, as PTSD. Uh, this was very important, again, for uh, um, politically, uh, this was the movement uh, to get it recognized was in order basically to get benefits for returning veterans from Vietnam. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the history behind it. Uh, before that, um, again, talking about shell shock, it was basically seen as uh, people who are cowardly, um, and one, one method of treatment was to just be shot on sight. Um, so again, uh, it's complicated trying to study the history of this. Uh, but again, as you can see, um, there are uh, basically the attempt to, to give some sort of general definition for what's PTSD, uh, which of course exists outside the military, uh, but it's the military that, that sort of brought it into being. So if you think about just the name, uh, what's interesting again is that it, it's basically um, trying to suggest this idea that after an event that's so disturbing uh, that our normal coping mechanisms are overpowered, uh, we have this, uh, again, disordered way of life, uh, things like hypervigilance, uh, things like uh, being unable to be in groups, um, constant concern with death, constant concern with vulnerability. And again, this is what I found kind of fascinating, um, maybe just because I'm a, a neurotic Jew individual, but I, again, the idea that, um, you know, that, that uh, it's not normal uh, to, to be preoccupied with vulnerability, to be preoccupied with death, that you're supposed to enjoy being out in crowds, um, and that uh, this is what, again, is being diagnosed as, as uh, symbol, symptomatic of, of a disorder. So how is it treated? Again, uh, we often have uh, medication in the United States. That's our, our uh, most common way of treating almost any psychological disorder. Uh, psychoanalysis, uh, there are various forms of it. Uh, group therapy is most common. Uh, more recently, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, again, learning to, to basically break certain associations and learn new associations, so similar to uh, treating addiction, for example. Um, and interestingly is this development of exposure therapy, uh, which is, uh, of course, as everything nowadays, allows us to use things like virtual reality technology uh, as a way to try to treat, uh, primarily because again, uh, members of the military uh, active and veterans basically don't like the therapy, don't want the therapy. Uh, and again, there's a large concern in the United States, especially about this idea of being stigmatized for going to therapy. 
So one of the interesting things, again, is the idea of using technology as a way to basically get therapy without being seen as seeking therapy. Uh, so it's more like you're playing a video game than seeing a therapist. So this is uh, one of the earlier versions of this, uh, virtual Vietnam. Uh, there, of course, has now become uh, virtual Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I found this fascinating. Again, this was the kind of research uh, that I was um, learning about when I was first writing the book, uh, was again this idea that this was being uh, tested on veterans and being found to be effective. Um, but again, from a philosophical perspective, for me, the question was, well, what does it mean that it is effective, right? So what does that tell us about uh, PTSD? Um, and what does it mean, again, that you can uh, learn to habituate yourself to these experiences uh, by being exposed, again, to what originally traumatized you and basically reliving it over and over again while a therapist tries to tell you, uh, you know, don't respond the way you respond. Instead, uh, learn to respond uh, more healthily, right? So don't get freaked out, don't feel guilty. Uh, again, realize uh, this wasn't under your control, there wasn't anything you could do. Um, so one example they gave uh, for an everyday example of this was someone uh, who was traumatized because their house burned down. And so every time they hear a fire alarm or something that sounds like a fire alarm, they have a traumatic episode. And what was interesting to me was they saw successful treatment in getting this person to no longer be worried uh, that a fire alarm meant that they were going to uh, burn in a fire, which is ironic given that the whole point of a fire alarm is to make you afraid and run for your life. So it's again, this interesting dynamic of um, trying to make you have uh, a normal reaction to the threat of fire, which for us importantly was, uh, you know, don't, don't get too scared. Right, so again, this idea of like, there's a healthy amount of fear, you can have too much, too little. So uh, what did all this mean? Uh, again, this idea that we have coping mechanisms that are supposed to help us deal with events outside the norm. PTSD, uh, we have an inability to cope that is seen as giving us an abnormal fear of death. And therapy, again, uh, tries to habituate you to the event such that the extraordinary is made ordinary, right? So again, trying to think about uh, what does all this mean philosophically? So this is sort of the, the big picture argument of the book. That we think, uh, again, becoming habituated uh, is normal, it's healthy, not being habituated is abnormal, is unhealthy. What is healthy is enjoying life, ignoring death, and what is unhealthy is fearing death and not enjoying life. And I wanted to argue that actually, because from an existential perspective, uh, death and vulnerability are what life is, uh, that war uh, exposes us to that aspect of life that we otherwise try to hide and, and escape from. Um, and so that peace, uh, again, um, is this perspective of evading instead of confronting reality, such that because of, well, basically the numbers involved, the non-combatants perspective comes to dominate the combatants perspective, and one side gets to pathologize the other. So this is why I tried to replace the language of PTSD uh, with the language of exile, with, again, this idea that, um, you are, you are basically treated as if, uh, you know, you cannot um, uh, participate in daily life until you act like the rest of us, right? And it's not, um, what can I learn from your perspective, but instead, how can I medicate your perspective away, right? Um, and again, it was interesting to me, um, at presentations on this topic that I've given, I've had veterans come up to me afterwards and say, you know, you've helped me to understand, uh, for example, why I, I hate parades. And I said, you know, I, I go back to my hometown and they make me put on my military uniform and parade through town. 
and then nobody ever again looks at me as, as a neighbor, they look at me as, as a warrior, right, as a veteran. Um, and then that's how you get identified, that's how you get treated, and you can never stop uh, feeling that way. And this is why one of the interesting things about things like group therapy um, is that similar to returning to war, is that uh, the idea of war being more comfortable, more feeling at home uh, than at peace. So again, this is why um, I was curious about what that means, that relationship uh, to war and peace and what it means about, again, feeling at home in the world versus not feeling at home in the world. So uh, let me just go through uh, the meat of the book now. That was the, the quick overview. And if, if anyone wants to stop and ask a question, feel free. Um, so here is Michael Walter, uh, the person I am predominantly criticizing in the book. This is- uh, Professor uh, Gers, yeah. I think there is a question from Professor Abdul uh, Chilik on the chat. Oh, the chat. In therapy, don't they make you accept that death is a reality rather than ignoring it, ignoring death? Yeah, well, again, it's this idea of, um, sorry, thanks for the question. Um, it's again, this idea that um, accepting death as a reality uh, can mean many things, right? So it's, it's again, sort of, um, what I saw as, as the clinical uh, version of acceptance was essentially ignoring, right? So again, this idea that um, like there is a, an idea of excessively grieving, for example, right? This idea that we have a normal grief period and then you're supposed to go back with your life. Um, but if you can't stop grieving, then this is seen as something's wrong with you, right? So again, this idea, um, one way I thought about PTSD as well was this idea of veterans basically viewing um, uh, everyday life like a funeral um, and being confused that everyone else is having a good time at a funeral instead of feeling like them, right? So again, this idea of um, uh, going back to like the philosopher Martin Heidegger, um, who is also important in my book, this idea that, you know, we turn death uh, into sort of idle chatter. Right. So it's something that, you know, you say, like, of course, everybody dies, yada, yada, yada. Um, but you treat it like you know, something that's going to happen far in the future, something that happens to other people, um, but not something that could happen, you know, at any point to anyone. Right. Uh, this came out more in my nihilism and technology book uh, when I talked about transhumanism, for example, and this idea of um, using technology to seek more uh, immortality. Right. So again, this idea um, that even when we are talking about death, it seems like we're kind of talking past it rather than willing to really confront it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, we could talk about that more later, maybe. Um, but back to uh, to Walter. Um, so the book that he wrote uh, during the Vietnam War, Just and Unjust Wars, uh, this is a book he wrote uh, uh, in honor of that book, um, sort of looking back at it. And he's saying that, you know, what his uh, contribution was to take Augustine, St. Augustine's uh, just war um, traditional view and turn it into a secular um, ethical theory that could be used now. And again, specifically with, as you can see here at the bottom, highlighted this idea um, that basically because of World War II, uh, because of the Holocaust, this idea of like, you know, we would love to be pacifists, but when you're facing Nazis, you can't be a pacifist. So that was what just war theory was supposed to be about. Um, that basically, what do you do when war uh, is unavoidable, right? So again, uh, historically, you have um, this, this awkward attempt to merge uh, the Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and this is where just war tradition really comes out. You know, and Augustine basically has this brilliant idea that Jesus says, turn the other cheek. 
uh, that should be taken metaphorically, not literally. Uh, and this idea that basically you can you can be a Christian warrior, but you have to feel bad about it. Uh, and this is this is really uh, what I see as sort of the the origins of things like PTSD in uh, Christianity. So this is sort of the uh, religious underpinning of Walzer's Just War Theory, uh, the Ambrosian uh, use ad bellum focus, and then the Augustinian uh, use in bellow. Uh, and again, this idea um, that you can justify war under certain conditions, right? That's, that's basically the big picture. Um, so again, this idea of how do you make a religious theory a secular theory? That's really the achievement of Walter. Um, and what he did was basically replace God with common morality. And this is what my, my PhD was criticizing, uh, was this assumption of common morality, uh, which you, uh, if, you're, if you're an ethicist, you see it kind of everywhere. Um, so it's sort of the dominant view nowadays, uh, common morality, otherwise known as common sense morality. Um, you see this again, especially in technology, this sort of taken for grantedness of, you know, oh, we're all humans, so we all have the same morality, so we can all judge each other. Um, and increasingly, this means that, you know, people like me who do ethics for a living uh, are sort of seen as, as an aberration, right? Like, we, we don't need you. Right. We, we, we could do ethics on our own. Um, and the idea that we can't is seen as sort of uh, demeaning somehow. And again, importantly, was this idea at the bottom here that if you challenge common morality, um, it was seen again in line with my arguments about exile as basically saying that you're not a human being. Right. That to to not feel this way, uh, there must be something wrong with you. Right. So, again, this sort of pathologizing term. Right. You should feel this way if you don't. There's not something wrong with the theory. There's something wrong with you. So here is an overview uh, if you if you're not familiar already. Uh, we don't need to go too much into detail, but this is sort of the, uh, the dominant view, especially in the United States, of how to justify war. Uh, this has sort of been codified in the laws of armed conflict. Um, and what was, again, interesting was this idea of how this um, comes down to the question of responsibility. Um, and what I found especially fascinating was that he turns to this philosopher, J. Len Gray, uh, who was a student of Heidegger's, a phenomenologist at uh, Columbia University in the United States. And the same day he got his PhD uh, in the mail, he got his draft notice that he was going to uh, fight in World War II. Uh, and he writes a book about his experience uh, called The Warriors, um, where he tries to give a phenomenological account of what it's like to become a soldier. And Walzer turns to this for his account of responsibility. But interestingly, he rejects Gray's own interpretation of it. So Gray says, this is how to understand responsibility but nobody can hold you responsible, only you can hold yourself responsible. And again, Walzer, going back to the common morality view, says, well, that's ridiculous. That's not how morality works. So I'll take your principle, but I can apply it to other people. So importantly, uh, everything is about responsibility. And this idea he takes from Gray, uh, that I can hold you responsible to the degree to which you are free to make a different decision, right? Um, so again, this raises the question, well, how can I judge your freedom? Uh, and again, this is shockingly going to come down to common morality. Uh, and this is going to be applied through what I described as casuistry and empathic projection. So casuistry is, is basically just using uh, past cases as evidence. Uh, so here's what people like you did in the past because they could do it. You should have been able to do it. That's the casuistry argument. And then the empathic projection is, again, the common morality idea. Um, because I'm a human being, I can, put your, I can put myself in your shoes. So this is, again, the idea 
um, I can judge you because we're human. Even though I've never been to war, even though I've never had military training, I'm human, you're human, I can judge you. So I saw in this uh, basically a reduction of responsibility to causality. And again, this idea uh, that basically I'm only responsible for what I cause. And this is really, uh, again, um, going back to Aristotle, this idea of the classic division into voluntary, involuntary. Um, and I am just using this as a, as a way to try to determine, um, you know, who gets blamed and how much. Uh, and that's really what responsibility becomes about, right? You being judged by other people uh, using this kind of way of thinking. Uh, and I wanted to criticize that by instead uh, actually going back to Jake Len Gray and really looking at his arguments. And again, in line with Heidegger, he provides, a, a, like I said, a phenomenological account of responsibility. And again, this idea that to be responsible is literally to be able to respond. And again, you have this very Heideggerian language uh, that you hear the call of conscience uh, which is, again, something that only arises because you've been awakened such that you hear it, right? So this idea that, that war uh, for Gray is an example of a situation that sort of forces you um, to not necessarily be awakened, but at least to be put into a situation where you could be awakened, right? So he talks about, importantly, this idea of how liberating it is uh, to stay asleep, basically, right? Um, and this idea that, um, you know, we, we hold soldiers responsible uh, for the choices they make, but he says, importantly, it, it has to be appreciated the degree to which you have to be awakened uh, to even recognize that a choice is possible. So this is what he talks about with the idea of, again, things like the Nuremberg trials and the idea of, you know, I'm just following orders. Um, he doesn't want to excuse their behavior, but he does say there, there is something to it that he can appreciate, right? That there is something uh, in his own experience on the other side fighting Nazis um, in this idea that when you are, you're trained to become a soldier and given orders, um, that the idea of questioning those orders isn't that simple, right? That that's something that you really have to be broken out of your habits, out of your training, uh, to even think about that's something that could be questioned, right? And again, I think of this in terms uh, similar to how Marx talks about capitalism, right? This idea that you know um, it's not easy to to question your alienated experience if that's all you know. Right. So again, you sort of get trained into a way of life. Um, you need a sort of kind of experience to make you question that. Um, and so again, this idea that we take those we take those experiences to be traumatizing. Uh, but the question is: Is the trauma necessarily uh, something that we should be trying to avoid instead of trying to appreciate? again, from an existential phenomenological perspective, right? That's, that's sort of the idea. So again, uh, this gives us a sort of different model of responsibility. Where again, for Gray, um, when he says, you know, you can't hold other people responsible, that isn't a denial of responsibility. He wants to say, no, that that's because, um, you know, to be human is to be responsible. So really, I should want to be uh, responsible. I should be holding myself responsible. I should be taking responsibility, right? So again, ethics for, uh, for Jake Glenn Gray isn't about how to hold other people accountable, um, but instead about how to appreciate the degree to which um, I am in a society which does not make me appreciate responsibility, right? Um, so again, the degree to which uh, we are in a society um, where denial of responsibility is what's normal and taking on responsibility is seen as pathological. So again, for Gray, if you're thinking about things like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
if you as an American, if you as a human being feel responsible for that, feel guilt for that, um, he thinks that's, that's you're being awakened to what it means to be human, you're not pathological, right? And again, that there's something wrong with you instead, uh, if you don't feel that way, and not only don't feel that way, but try to get people to stop feeling that way, right? So this is similar in America right now, uh, discussions of things like critical race theory, right? This idea, um, well, I wasn't alive during slavery, why should I be guilty as a white person, right? And again, for Gray, it's more the opposite, right? Like, why doesn't everyone feel guilty about this? Like, this is something a human did to another human being. You're a member of that species. This should be something we all feel guilty about, right? So that was, again, uh, the, the philosophical perspective there. Um, and again, how does this uh, boil down to PTSD? Uh, again, this idea of being able to judge other people. And again, it's important, the success of just war theory that this has become the dominant uh, ethics taught in military academies, taught in military training, uh, means that when you, when you uh, come back from war, you get into this understanding that people are going to feel comfortable judging you. That's the idea, right? Uh, so again, if we go back to the quote uh, from the beginning, you know, it makes sense to, to think of what Carl experienced as an example of PTSD. And to think about experiences like what Carl Marlantes describes here uh, about his experiences in Vietnam. Um, as again, uh, the kind of thing that, that um, Walter would say, yeah, that, that means you're a bad person, right? It's, it's very simple to say, um, if you felt any experience like loving, hating war, um, that means again, right, there's, there's something wrong with you. Um, and Walter is pretty explicit about this. Um, basically, you should try to run away from war. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. Because again, Walter's saying, well, that's what I would do, right? So what's interesting is um, if you go back to medieval uh, Christianity, there actually was a very different understanding. Uh, again, even in Augustine, this idea of concupiscence, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that properly. Uh, but again, this idea uh, that we had a very different understanding of how to treat uh, warriors coming back from war, uh, where again, you had sort of a, a table of, uh, if this is what you did, then this is what you have to do to clean your hands, right? So Walzer talks about this uh, dirty hands phenomenon, and it comes quite literally out of the, uh, again, Christianity, and this sort of table of penances uh, which, which is kind of fascinating if you have time to look into it. It's, it's uh, you know, like if you shoot this many people with an arrow, here's what you have to do. Uh, how many days you have to stay outside the community. How many days you have to work on building a church. Um, and again, this idea that basically um, there was a very clear process uh, for how to purify yourself through these penance uh, procedures in order to come back and join the community. Uh, which again, uh, you know, why, why did this work? And what does it mean that we stopped doing this? Uh, again, we in the sense of just war theory replacing Christianity. Uh, so again, here are some various theories from different religions about why this uh, practice was meant to work. Again, uh, either blood as, as a disease that you have to quarantine against, uh, blood as, as a symbol of the, the spirit of the dead that you have to appease, or again, uh, as some sort of contamination of the sin of the soul that you have to purify. So it's interesting, again, uh, this idea that, um, you know, there, there's reason to feel shame, but you can uh, use your penance to overcome it. But in just war theory, this instead gets replaced uh, with guilt, right? So again, uh, because of there, there being a replacement of Christianity with uh, secular common morality, uh, there is no penance anymore. There's instead just, it makes sense for you to feel bad. What you did was bad, 
you know, we, we know in common morality, killing is wrong. We asked you to kill in our name, sure, but you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have done it. this uh, classic paradox. So again, um, this then for, for my argument explains uh, how just war theory contributes to PTSD. That was, that was part of the argument of my book. That again, um, we have uh, dangerously taken um, a religious way of looking at the world and made it secular uh, without really appreciating, again, um, all the steps involved in the religious process. And very important, this idea of externalization through the church being replaced with internalization. Uh, this is um, compounded even more, uh, again, about the idea that when you used to return from war, uh, because of the march home, uh, you also had a very long period of time to really do this kind of penance, right? Um, but nowadays, uh, you know, you can be flown home from war very quickly, or now with drone warfare, you can fight war from home. So again, war, uh, the time period has shrunk, which is another important thing to think about in terms of PTSD. Um, so again, our classic way of treating this in the United States is always uh, any problem can be solved with technology. Um, so of course, if you want to uh, cure PTSD, it's not uh, don't fight war. Uh, instead, it's just fight war with uh, people as far away from the battlefield as possible. And then you get articles like this, uh, where you get drone operators being treated like some sort of, uh, you know, inhuman god of war who just loves killing. Um, and again, what was fascinating uh, during the Obama years, uh, there was an attempt to uh, create a special medal uh, for drone operators, uh, but there was such outrage uh, that Obama apologized and, and, and removed the medal, right? Because again, this idea that you're not a soldier, you're a cubicle warrior, right? Uh, this is, these are just gamers with weapons. Um, so again, this idea that, um, that we had fixed war with technology, and so anyone who fights shouldn't feel anything anymore, right? Um, and again, this idea um, that because of the perception of looking down at ants on the ground that you shouldn't feel anything about killing, uh, instead it has to be how to stop you from enjoying it, right? So again, there has to be a kill chain in order to prevent the drone warrior from enjoying it too much. Um, but what was interesting was the, the actual uh, research, if you actually looked into what was happening with drone pilots was, was not what we expected, right? That they were actually uh, experiencing uh, symptoms like PTSD as well. Uh, and some studies showed it to actually be experienced at higher rates than people on the ground. So again, this question of what the hell is going on, right? Uh, we take for granted that distance should mean uh, less caring, less feeling, but that wasn't what was happening, uh, which for me, again, revealed sort of the mind-body dualism that we're taking for granted, right? That if you remove the mind from the body, then there's no reason that you should feel trauma. Uh, so again, we, we know this from Descartes, uh, that we should be able to do this. Um, Weirdly, we talk in philosophy about being post-Cartesian, and yet it seems pretty obvious Descartes won. Um, and again, using philosophy of technology, uh, it was important trying to understand what these soldiers were experiencing, um, that it was taken for granted that they would uh, um, experience basically only embodiment relations. Um, we can talk more about that if you want. Uh, but again, this idea that basically they were they were relating to the drone not just as a as a power extension, but as something that they really um, created a level of intimacy on the battlefield that we'd never experienced before, uh, which for me helped to understand why, rather than this is the assumption that you would only feel power, only have amorality. Uh, that instead there is suffering, there is responsibility, even when talking about drone warfare. Um, and again, this is why we just have this uh, 
constant multiplication of ways to treat PTSD uh, and constant attempts, uh, as you can see here, to try to use technologies uh, to fix everything and then are shocked uh, when soldiers don't respond to the technology the way we expect. So that even when a, a robot that's supposed to save lives gets destroyed, uh, soldiers feel very upset with, again, my argument, that basically, um, it should not shock us that soldiers treat robots this way because the soldiers are treated the same way by civilians, right? You're, you're just a, a piece of military hardware that we send to get destroyed in our name. And when you get destroyed, we replace you. Hence the exile. So that's, that's the overview of the book. I, I hope uh, that made some sense. <laughs> if not, I apologize because it's uh, late on a Friday and I'm somewhat delirious, but uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Gertz. It's really, really amazing. <laughs> uh, the presentation and, and of course the book. Uh, so for now, and of course the book includes many other ideas the time didn't allow you to cover. So now, uh, if anyone has a question, we'll be happy to open the floor for uh, asking Professor Gertz whatever we need. Uh, yes, uh, Professor uh, my supervisor. Can you hear me now? Yes, Hojan, we can. Okay. Thank you for the excellent talk. I learned a lot. And I'm no way a, a theorist, so excuse me uh, for my ignorant question. But uh, can you go back to the last slide where you were talking about uh, the real uh, relationship between unmanned device and huh, that one, and un uh, unmanned warfare and suffering and responsibility? <laughs> Is that because? Uh, still in unmanned technology, the one who kills uh, receives a stimuli that is seeing the violence, uh, right? So people who are not involved in war, uh, seeing graphic pictures of war get affected, the, the secondary traumas and so on. So <laughs> if this technology improves in quotation, <laughs> uh, that's uh, link is cut off because you cut off the st uh, stimuli. Uh, in other words, it's not. Uh, in other words, uh, we need still uh, we still need a factor to explain that relationship because you indirectly experience the war and it's the feelings that make that causality work. Yeah, I think this was this was the belief, right? That that again. Um, the 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 arc of uh, military technology innovation uh, is to try to always increase distance from death, with the idea that the further you are away from the um, the cause and effect relationship, the less responsibility you feel, the less trauma you feel, right? Um, and what I was trying to show was that actually distance. Um, is mediated by technology. And that means that uh, we cannot take for granted that physical distance is the same thing as sort of a, a emotional distance or existential distance, right? So again, this idea um, that what drone operators were describing as a level of intimacy that had never really been experienced in war, right? So again, it's, it's sort of forgotten um, that the point of drones um, they're not primarily killing machines, they're primarily surveillance machines, right? So again, this idea that you have um, an intimate knowledge of targets, that you're studying them for days, weeks at a time, uh, trying to acquire all of their relationships. And then even if you do take out a target, you then are studying everyone who comes to them and following each of these people, right? So you're, you're following uh, people you kill, um, and then the people who care about them, and then you kill them, and then the people they care about. So again, this idea that you develop a web of relationships through the surveillance technology, 
that's obviously very different from firing a machine gun, right? Um, so that was what I was trying to understand and, and try to argue um, that we, we cannot, uh, you know, try to, every, everything we've done to try to fix PTSD through technology, um, I was trying to show backfired and doesn't, uh, for my money, doesn't, uh, it's not shocking to me based on my philosophical perspective um, that it did backfire, if that answers your question. Uh, Erwin, I think you have a question. Yeah, okay. I, I can also speak um, on, on behalf of my question as well. Thank you, Professor Gertz, uh, for this great talk. And uh, it was a pleasure reading your book. Thanks to Samer, who also introduced you and uh, your book to our colloquium as well. Um, I was wondering, like, whether driving your ideas from the book, obviously, can we relate metaverse? or such developments with transhumanism or posthumanism for that matter? Like, is it also part of people seeking immortality in a way? I was curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is again, what my, my most recent books have been about, uh, is again, this idea of uh, trying to evade reality, right? And that this is, this is what I, uh, you know, uh, why the subtitle of the book is from the humanity of war to the inhumanity of peace with this idea of, of uh, what we take to be peace uh, is primarily uh, escape from reality, right? What again, I, I talk about nihilism. Um, so for example, going back to things like the uh, COVID, uh, it wasn't a surprise how quickly people were, were ready to quarantine uh, because technology has allowed us to basically quarantine for years, right? So again, you saw protests against things like masks. I did not see protests against things like Zoom, right? Uh, so again, this idea, um, uh, we're, we're already creating a metaverse without the VR technology, right? I, I spend all day in front of a computer. Uh, who knows what you're wearing below the camera? Uh, I teach to uh, you know box black boxes on the screen. I don't know if they're there, um, and it's it's again this sort of you know we're kind of sharing a reality, but also kind of not. Um, if you don't like what someone says, you can mute them. Um, you could take the recording and make your own you know edit it however you want. Create a deep fake video having me say whatever you want me to say, right? Um, so I don't even need virtual reality technology to create a virtual reality, right? Um, and it clearly, again, the idea that that this is something that uh, is not only uh, being done by Mark Zuckerberg and others, but being championed uh, and being talked about openly in the press, again, reveals, uh, you know, there must be some desire for this, right? Um, it's not just him forcing it on us there are clearly people who want it right um and it's again uh what worries me is again uh the idea that that people uh, we've become essentially so individualized so atomized so first person perspective um that transhumanism isn't seen as as dangerous it's seen as a great potential right um, because obviously, if all of us never die, that, that creates a lot of problems. Um, but clearly, the, the idea is, well, that's a problem for other people, not for me, right? Uh, so again, it, it reveals how much that way of thinking has sort of expanded uh, to, again, the sort of taken for granted, well, that's common morality, that's how everybody feels. Thank you. So, any other question? So, yeah, let me. Can I ask, the... ask, hello. Yes, Zulfikar, please go ahead. And just to open the video, sorry, I. Uh, okay, is it clear now? Yeah. yeah. Hello, clean. hello everyone. Um, I'm Zulfikar. I'm an artist, first of all, and I do some. Uh, so. Uh, 
Wow, I just joined like uh, 20 minutes ago and they catch up the things. Thank you all, all of you actually. Uh, my question briefly, uh, first I do uh, these traditional martial arts in which like Tai Chi Chuan, uh, Kung Fu and yoga and this all of these studies. Uh, besides, I'm very interested in humanities studies. Uh, uh, it goes parallel with my uh, also work in art. And I live now in Berlin. Uh, I could also pass the, these uh, harsh events through war in Syria. And I have no doubt that I have actually several, uh, this what, um, what's known as disorders stress disorders or all of that things and through art actually and I could um, manage myself and now with um, collaboration sometimes with the Gestalt Institute Berlin uh, we could do some um, uh, by expressive arts kind of not uh, um, what do you call it healing by art rather uh, supporting uh, which uh, which called uh, expressive arts. This is like, uh, besides my artwork, my own, my personal artworks, it's like um, a volunteering support for me and for other people. So my question is, um, when I came here to Europe, I, even before I recognized that uh, what, the practice or the understanding of this, um, of understand, uh, uh, let me, sorry. Um, I recognize that the practice of yoga and this, all of the things and meditation and this deep um, understanding is uh, looking, uh, look to me actually kind of superficial, like, uh, like um, stylish, becoming stylish, and in which um, I don't know, it's like uh, being um, to me as a social uh, interaction, rather to be inner management or inner engineering. So this like, this, um, I, I find a lot of like, misleading, misunderstanding uh, by a lot of people uh, to this kind of, um, I call it actually science. I call it, um, I see it as a science, but in a different uh, world, different terms when, in which like ancient words. And we in uh, Middle East, actually, I uh, recognize that we have a lot of this kind of art in, in singing, uh, because besides I, I do studies, I, I st I'm studying now the maqam music in Arabic uh, maqam, in the, uh, the concept of this singing, how you meditate and how you treat yourself through this kind of art, uh, whether it's like painting or uh, theater games or um, uh, singing and uh, what do you call it? All, all kind of, uh, all, and all type of arts. And, um, and still uh, a lot of people, especially in Arab, uh, Arabic uh, understanding, um, they look at it as just entertainment. Uh, okay, art has this kind of entertainment, but besides art is like, to me is like a great temple you can enter to it and catch, learn a lot, a lot of many things. Uh, while it's kind of the, the policy of a lot of social media drives people somehow, the understanding, the conscious of people to connect art only with entertainment. And this is, I see it a huge mistake. I want your uh, feedback and I, it's not a question actually, it's like um, common. And I would like to hear after this, uh, I'm not sure if I make it clear now. Um, 
Is it clear to you, Professor? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I just there, trusted there you because lot, I was I was there. outside and I wanted to to join the the yeah. session. No, I I, I appreciate. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I, I think. Um, uh, I'm not sure how to respond, uh, to be honest, but I, I think uh, there's a lot uh, to talk about. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much of it is relevant to this talk, uh, but maybe uh, uh, if we give a, if I give a talk on nihilism and technology book, maybe that would be more relevant to your question. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Gertz. He was asking about like art uh, as being transformed into entertainment, yeah. uh, like uh, or advertisement or economic activity rather than spiritual salvation or whatever. So yeah, and it, this is indeed this question is to, so much related to your book Nihilism and Technology. Right. So uh, if there is no other question, I have a few questions to you, but I don't want to make them long. So. My first question um, about your dealing with common morality. You said that common morality makes like it is now the new God for justifying uh, uh, war and so on. But and when we get out of common morality to the exile, then we become the responsibility. We became the becoming instead of becoming instead of becoming fixed identities. So we enter the open space of becoming. Ourselves are open and so on. This open thing, this becoming, this is thriving, is conditioned on getting out of the common sense, of the common morality, sorry, right? So doesn't that lead, doesn't that lead us to relativism? That means anything can mean anything. This is my first question. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I think a, a common problem with with existentialism broadly, um, and I think this is why, for example, Sartre um, tried to say that you know he he wasn't advocating uh, relativism in um, challenging ob objectivity. Um, because he had this notion of intersubjective, right? So again, this idea of, of shared understanding. Um, and again, I saw common morality um, as basically a, a, a top-down instead of bottom-up uh, experience, right? So again, um, that I want, I want there to be uh, going back to like Hannah Arendt, uh, this idea of, of politics as a space for um, sharing different experiences of the world in order to build them into each other, into an experience of the world. So there is some degree of relativism, but again, it's, it's not the end, that's the beginning, right? So the idea of, of bringing together our our vast difference, uh, different experiences, different perspectives, that this is something uh, to appreciate, that we can, we can then have dialogue. Um, and this is what politics is supposed to be, right? Not a dirty word, but something that we actually champion again as part of what it means to be human. Um, and so it, it's uh, dangerous, um, to assume relativism is a bad thing, uh, something invented by postmodernism, but instead to, to say like, no, obviously we have different experiences, uh, but that doesn't mean we're closed off from each other. Okay, thank you so much. This is really great and uh, clear. So my second question is, you talked in your book about responsibility as an identity. We are responsible as human be as human being, and you linked it to what you called metaphysical guilt. So, according to the metaphysical uh, guilt, me, according to metaphysical guilt, uh, not war is what causes misery, but indeed our condition 
as a human being is what causes war. So we are bad, we, we, make, we make war, not vice versa, right? And then in your section, when you were talking about uh, torture, because your book has three sections, like mainly war, torture, and uh, drones, you criticized the dualism, the card uh, dualism between body, mind, uh, will, knowledge, etc. Uh, however, it is not. I mean, my question is that because how you and why you criticize dualism is not clear for me. So my, my question is how responsibility as an identity, as we as human being, is related or is contingent on if it is any if if any on negating dualism. There is no mind body, it's only one. Yeah. Um, so again, the degree to which uh, to be responsible is to be human, um, to be embodied is to be human, right? Um, so again, the degree to which uh, we want to reduce responsibility to causality, um, there's also part of that a reduction because of mind-body dualism to say, well, that those are bodily experiences, right? Um, and again, that ability to then uh, shuffle off responsibility for things the body does, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, worrying, again, going back to the metaverse question, this idea that, um, that surely this must be better because it's less embodied. Um, and that again, it sort of repeats uh, this classic uh, Christian equation of the body as sin, um, and that the body is the is sort of the prison of the soul, right? Um, and that if you could only escape from it, uh, whether it's through death going to heaven or um, transhumanism going to the cloud, uh, that again you you would then finally achieve bliss. Um, so there, there's clearly some sort of connection between evading humanity, evading responsibility, evading the body, um, and that there is sort of a shared disgust across those, right? Um, that there is something, um, again, going back to the idea of already being in quarantine, uh, long before COVID, we already sort of saw each other as, as something that made us sick, right? Uh, this is one that Nietzsche talked about already, this idea that, uh, you know, we, we don't like being around each other. We're trying to stay as far apart. Um, I always talk about the idea of being on a public bus um, and how quickly everyone is to take their, their bag and put it on the seat next to them. And you have that sort of Donald Trump inside of you building the wall against other people coming near you. And this weird experience when someone wants to sit next to you and you, you kind of uh, try to wield what little power you have and judge them as worthy or unworthy. And then if they do sit down, uh, you of course very passive aggressively show how much you, you're bothered by this. But if, if their knee crosses the border, right? And touches your knee, right? It's just, it's just war, right? Um, and again, this idea that we use technology to cocoon ourselves from each other because you just want to get to where you're going with as little human contact as possible. Um, and this is sort of a microcosm for how technology helps us get through life generally, right? I just want to get to where I'm going, leave as, as little human connection as possible. Okay, thank you so much. So any other, yeah, Damla, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for this inspiring talk uh, in the first place. And um, so you made a distinction between traditional war warfare and unmanned warfare. And here uh, you're talking about alienation. But I was wondering if this alienation you are talking about is alienation from the self or alienation from that uh, which is constructed as other, for example. And also you also mentioned that in your talk. Uh, the drones are commonly used for surveillance purposes, but also drones uh, can uh, drops uh, can drop bombs um, on soldiers, on uh, troops, for example. 
so uh, I was uh, wondering, I mean, so uh, for example, a US drone is dropping bombs uh, in soldiers on soldiers in Afghanistan, then the Afghan soldiers know that it's you it's US is doing right. So I'm just giving an example. So it's really impossible to uh, isolate this experience of being bombed, even though it's done um, but carried out by a drone. I mean, so uh, what kind of alienation are you talking about? I mean, it's impossible to uh, dissociate yourself and your body uh, from this experience of being bombed just because it's done by the drones. But you know, uh, it's uh, the decision is made by the US government or uh, security office and so on. So what do you think about this? I would like to hear your comments on this. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the, the alienation is, is the perspective of the drone operator. Uh, so again, the idea that you um, are, are put in uh, um, uh, an RV, uh, basically, you know, a, a, a vehicle uh, that's uh, now increasingly somewhere in the desert in Nevada, uh, where you you live nearby, you drive to work, you have a nine to five schedule, um, and you're put in something that looks a lot like a video game uh, arcade setup. Um, such that again, this idea that you are um, you are not supposed to feel what you're doing, right? Um, so there are these stories of drone operators saying, uh, you know, we we got the we got the green light, uh, shoot, uh, you know, the building, and they say things like, you know, I think I saw um, a child. I, I don't want to shoot, and then they get command saying, oh, that, that wasn't a child, that was a dog, just take the shot, right? And again, going back to the idea of how this changes warfare, um, because everything is recorded, then you can, you can actually watch your kill over and over and over again. And so you have drone operators who talk about that experience and saying, you know, like, I know it wasn't a dog, right? Um, but the, the official report says it is. And again, this idea that um, your own government is telling you that you didn't do what you know you did, right? Um, so you are you are divided against yourself officially, and everything in the setup is supposed to make you feel this division, right? Um, and again, this is something that in the United States, at least, um, and in England, has been sort of fantasized. Um, in sci-fi, in science fiction, uh, if you think about things like Ender's Game, uh, Orson Scott Card, this idea of, you know, wouldn't it be great if kids didn't know they were fighting in war? Um, and that this is what drone warfare is sort of replicating, right? So I was trying to argue, again, the move from torture uh, to drones, that this, this isn't better, right? So I was, I was trying to offer this as a criticism of moving from Bush to Obama as not uh, making war what uh, the media was telling us, right? That I was trying to argue that um, there's war and there's not fighting war. There is no weird in between that we wanted to have where it's like, no, we fixed it, right? Um, so even while we're criticizing uh, what Russia is doing to Ukraine, we're still dropping bombs in Yemen, right? So again, this idea that um, um, we, we want to separate not just the drone operator from the drone, but society from the drone warfare. So again, this sort of replicating this division, this alienation. And that's what I was trying to point out uh, by saying that the drone operator because of their embodied experience, that they're they're sort of the embodiment, uh, again, metaphorically as well as literally, of how the alienation doesn't succeed the way we want it to. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. So any other question? Okay, so I suppose there is no other question. 
So, Professor Nuringer, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and for this very nice discussion. I assume like everyone has enjoyed the presentation and the discussion as well. So thank you so much. And we stay in, in touch. We don't know what we can develop in the future. Yeah, that's great. I look forward to it. And uh, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for attending this uh, short talk. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.